Secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high. Get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners and settle down snugly at Mall Marker 420 in colorful Colorado. It is Sunday, July 26th. Monday, July 27th, for those of you across the pond and beyond, welcome to We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm so glad you guys could join us this evening. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and I'm so glad to see you guys here and uh, so happy to have a place for you to feel at home. You can find us right now live at Spreaker.com at We Are Paradox Media. You can also find us at Twitter, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Tumblr, YouTube, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, as well as Podcast Addict. So tonight I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight we will be talking to and getting to know um, Scott Varden and his wife, Laura Varden. You guys, welcome and thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you for having us. So um, could you guys go ahead and take a moment and let our guests know, um, like, like your history and what brought you to this point that you're at today? Okay, you can go for it. Okay. Um, like Tessa said, my name is Lara Varden. Uh, I actually, uh, well, it started out uh, as far as my background. Um, I actually was a teacher for many years. Uh, my first degree was in education. Uh, then, unfortunately, I got into a car accident, which totally changed my life, um, but that both my husband and I were in, but I unfortunately got a major brunt of that. Um, I also used to be a professional figure skater, and again, uh, the car accident really uh, upended my whole trajectory, and uh, during my convalescence, uh, I went back to school online, became a nationally certified paralegal. My husband did as well. Uh, then I had homeschooled my children for a little bit. And then uh, once our youngest uh, went to a, a type of preparatory school um, at Clarkson University, uh, we had an empty nest a year early. So my husband asked, hey, what do you want to do now? And I said, I want to go back to school. <laughs> so um, I'm, obviously I'm glossing over some things, but uh, I decided to work and do something in the medical biological field. And uh, I went back to get a degree in biochemistry, biology, pre-med, and ended up deciding that I wanted, I fell in love with research and decided to get uh, a PhD in uh, biomedical research. I'm actually in my fourth year as a PhD candidate right now uh, at Clarkson University, and I'm doing interdisciplinary biosciences and biotechnology program with the specialty in biomedical sciences and neuroscience, along with biomedical engineering. So, and I, uh, last year I received a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, uh, which covers me for three years, which will take me to the end of my uh, PhD so it's been keeping me quite busy. <laughs> um, but I actually met uh, Scott, oh goodness, back in uh, 1996 at my great-grandmother's 95th birthday party. Uh, we were seated across from each other, and we've been together ever since. Um, and it has been the most tremendous experience, life journey, life-altering uh, journey that I could ever imagine, and I am just so grateful for everything. So I will hand it over to him. Well, first, I, you should have that. She, she's a National Science Foundation fellow, and if someone doesn't understand what that means, they probably should research it. And she's also attended the uh, National Marine a marine biological right. laboratory uh, in Woods Hole. It was an advanced research training in stem cells and regeneration. She wrote her own NSF grant, edited it, and she was the only graduate student funded at Clarkson University in that year. So she's accomplished quite a bit. She, she, she goes and presents and speaks at international and national conventions in her field, and she She's very modest. She's very highly published. She just finished a book chapter uh, in, on her specialty and her basic direction of her, her PhD. Uh, and we're very proud of her. I mean, she's, she's come a long ways. Um, 
and we both have been through quite a bit. I, I went through 21 major surgeries in 14 years. Um, she had um, two, two or three, three. three back surgeries and several other procedures related to that accident. And she has her whole lower spine is fused and she has two cages in it. So that's a rough adjustment in one's life. And now she's back in great shape. She, uh, uh, we climb one or two mountains a week in the Adirondacks. Um, we have extensive gardening. Um, we have a new greenhouse we built. And uh, so we stay very busy and active. We've been growing most of our own uh, food for at least half of the year. Sometimes it's all the way into December because we move stuff indoors. And being as educated as she is in her ex- in her area, nothing gets in this house unless the label is totally vetted and then <laughs> got in line and made sure that it's true. And, you know, so that has helped us both physically with our health, with the problems we have overcome, plus the years when they, uh, the only way they thought they could treat this is with narcotic medication, of course, and we know where that's all ended for those companies and the participants of their scam as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, you know, and then so things started, we thought, settling down. And um, I uh, had discovered something that uh, was in relation to a terrorist case and um, actually I did the two local perpetrators that were working the smart university students in the four colleges in our area and trying to get um, them to participate in it. It's called the Secret Shoppers Check Scan. And and they paid the ultimate price on that deal. So um, I had a meeting late at night on September, uh, early in the morning on September 15th, 2014, and things were decided, and and we walked outside talking, and there were two other agencies uh, represented there. And um, the guy in the lead looks up at the sky and he goes, oh, my God, look at the sky. Everything seems so close. Well, when you looked at the sky, everything seemed so close because it was. Because when you fold space, it's going to make it look like that scene in contact when Jodie Foster met her father on that beach. And reached out and touched the stars. Because you actually can feel you can reach out and touch a constellation. I mean, that's how strange it was. Of course, we didn't understand what was going on. And immediately after that comment and a gaze of a few minutes at this incredibly beautiful sky, the officer behind me said, "Um, listen, listen to the coyotes. They don't talk like that. They're running around whining. Well, we live in an area where there are coyotes and wolves, and so you know the routine about running around on a full moon and chatting up a storm and getting together. So I looked up at the moon, and I realized it was a fourth quarter moon, but what came out of my mouth was, which is also a slack tide moon, and this is very important, um, was it's, um, it's not even a full moon. Well, what the F is that planet doing next to the moon? And so we looked up at it, and everybody said, I don't know, like we shouldn't have been concerned that there was a so-called planet next to the moon. But this planet was so-called like bursting plasma waves in different areas, and that's what was folding space. And that was what, it, it was in the eastern sky directly overhead. So that is what the ancients witnessed and called the star of Bethlehem. Who the story it's attributed to doesn't make any difference. But as I'll explain, all this all these things are related in the incident and the people involved, the names may have been changed, but the story is true. So I didn't realize what I was truly witnessing at that second. So we just kept on marveled at the folded space in every direction because you weren't seeing a whole bunch of constellations you were seeing very limited ones and so the um, the other two after 15 minutes got a little freaky 
and they said, we'll see it. <laughs> We're getting out of here. Boom. And they left. And so I stood there and I watched and watched. And then I ran inside, shut off the outdoor lights to have no light pollution. And uh, I just kept on looking at the sky and something caught my eye off to the northwest a little bit and just a little bit off east. And I thought what it was was a space station tumbling out of the sky, you know, like in this fashion. Um which kind of alarmed me. And, um, but then I checked the app that I have that tells me locations of certain things. And nope, it's on the other side of the world. So it's not the space station. So, well, I had, um, in my past work, I had been on certain details where something had come down from the sky. So there was no question to me since a young man was that they exist and, um, we're not the only life in the universe. Um, so in any event, so I said, well, let's we'll see what happens. And then after a very few minutes, cause this, uh, best I can judge it is this happened in a total of over 20 minutes from start to finish 20 minutes. So as soon as the star Bethlehem shut off its lights, um, this incredible starship, I don't, it was huge, absolutely huge. Rectangular shape, bow front uh, on upper, upper deck with windows. It pops out of the wormhole that was directly overhead. Since then, they have taught me all the math and all these things that are necessary to how they can do this. But the whole reason they do it is because, A, they're the messengers, and, B, they live 13.2 billion light years away. You can't travel faster than the speed of light, as far as I know. But what you can do is you can fold space and bring the beginning and the end of the wormhole together where you started and just go that small distance and fold that section of space. And you've already traveled further than what light can travel in that same distance, but in much less time. So that's what they were doing. That's what caused it to look like a tumbling double uh, concentric springs coming at you. Uh, makes perfect sense. Fold space on fold space so quick that it's just incredible. 13.2 billion light years away. And the reason I know this is because my nature is to dig deep into everything. Not just it happened, but why did it happen? Yeah. So it, took, it didn't take me long to find the documents that were necessary to identify these because in all of the agencies that deal with such matters, um, the only one that I found, and it was because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, was the Smirsh book, which was a KGB unit that dealt with aliens. And it described them, but the key here is that they called them the 217s to 222s. They visit, the last, their recorded visit was 35, 1935, I think it was Czechoslovakia, um, but it was a satellite country, the Soviet Union. And the strange thing is, is that uh, after they had given me the list, after my encounter, uh, uh, someone I knew was on that list and, and, and his expertise and the thing, he was the one they visited and he admitted it to me at a graduation ceremony after I explained what happened to me. And he used every piece of body language, including using this. What makes you think you're the only one? Well, somehow, for some reason, enlightened people can express themselves and they're constantly doing this. But what they're doing is they're pointing to the universe, they're pointing to the source, something that I didn't realize until they explained it to me. So <clears throat> um, I'm watching this ship and then all of a sudden I'm up, got getting close to the ship and on the right front side of the ship, there was a large wing that wasn't long, but it had a particular, uh, like a perfect airfoil shape. And on top of that wing was a plate, a black thick plate in the same shape as the wing. So the, it, it was, so the wing, the shape, uh, this plate could go back and forth without losing contact at all on the wing. And then it had an articulated joint that went straight up 
and then 90 degrees, another articulate articulated joint, and then it went straight into the side of the ship. Now, they did that for a reason. They wanted to make sure that I saw this certain piece of equipment and what it uh, was doing. And um, I can tell you what it was doing. It was, um, there's a song called Life in Technical, or the musical by Coldplay. And um, Gee, isn't that amazing that Chris Martin's on the list of enlightened people? Um, so what happens is uh, the music that I'm hearing is that song. Now, when, as I have found out later, when they visited me on St. Patrick's Day, and that has a relationship to something that I did solve the largest art heist in world history 26 years after it happened, um, because I never forget a face. And so uh, <clears throat> after after they brought me back and towards the end of the show, and I thought, oh, what, I must have fallen asleep. But I picked up a log and I wrote out the entire elements of the crime and the uh, people involved and the, um, the reason why it's so important for them to have these paintings recovered. Um, who lent them the cops uniform, what vehicle it was. You see, I had all these little things in my mind and little tips that I filed away because not one of them in itself was significant. And when you're the oldest daughter that you raised is uh, marries into the family and her father-in-law turns out to be one of the two brothers that borrowed those paintings from the Garden Museum Day on St. Patrick's Day, 1990. And, of course, you know who caught the heat for that? That was the Mafia. Thanks to uh, Special Agent Connolly and Whitey Bulger. I guess they got even with Whitey. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in any event, um, it all has a relationship because what they took were paintings from the masters. There weren't too many masters. Why were they the masters? Because they were also visited too, and they were on the list. And here's the reason. Because the messengers are like our babysitters, let's say. And they give us knowledge in, in three areas. And not just knowledge, it's the product of the knowledge. Technology, the arts and the sciences, and spirituality. Because the higher a species evolves in these areas without going out of bounds with one area is too far, the closer they get to the source. Makes perfect sense. Um, I was born and brought up in a small Adirondack community, 98% uh, uh, Catholic, so and a very much Catholic uh, maternal uh, side of the family, uh, especially when... One of your great aunts is like the principal of the of the Catholic school, and um, oh and you're not, oh my. <laughs> yeah, and you're, you know, I mean, and then another great aunt was the former dean at Amherst. Um, so, it, yeah, you get um, you get a little bit of shit shoved down your throat. Let's put it that way. Um, but I always question things because um, being visited all your life, you you have these things that other people don't and it doesn't always set well with other people, especially when you know a lie, when it's said, um, when you know something's wrong or not, when doing something, not doing something right and you call them on it and you don't even know why you did it, but you did it. Um, so it, it's a blessing and a curse in the same time. Um, so <clears throat> the relationship with the visit Okay, it's not just because of solving the Garden Museum of it, uh, because that's minor compared to some of the other work I have done. And it's been, uh, I had to tell uh, when I was uh, communicating with uh, uh, the director of the FBI, Comey, I had to tell him where to go and to get, look into some records. And he got back to me and said, he couldn't believe it. He says, God, did you really do all that? And I said, no, Jim, your people lie. They just make false reports all the time. Well, that's partially. I can't say that. No, they're good people. They work hard. But, but I know too much. 
especially when someone tells you, knowing that in February 94, John Gotti got a phone call from, of course, he was under recordings then. Poor John, that's right. No, not poor John. Come on. Um, that's what put him down, I think. And so what happens is a phone call is from uh, some people that I used to have to meet with to get um, certain things done, certain right things done, certain very important things done concerning our national security with the real junior soprano of North Jersey, an old guy named Mike Lorello. And I know what they do and everything. But, you know, sometimes when you have to work with someone and you really get to know them, everyone has a dark side. Um, some of them pretty dark. Um, but it's strange to say, but you can actually come to, you don't have to respect them, but you can come to love them as an individual. Um, what they did was very, very important. And, um, God, it's amazing how, how I, I'm going to, I'll bring this up. One of the things was, uh, how this, the communication secrets for the military payloads didn't make it to the Russians because someone intercepted them in the docks in the Hoboken. And the guy who had him in his anus, the microfiche, ended up getting on the ship and hoping there was a proctologist on the ship and he didn't have a stitch clothes on him. Of course, we would never do anything like that, but I know some people that would. So, so and anyway, Sorry, you just the ball to our dog. dog. We've got a dog that wants to play fetch 24-7. Orion down, I'm out. So, um, but as time comes, you... You, you see where every one of these things couldn't have taken a different turn. So uh, the guy named was Michael Arelli. Last time I used him was in 87 over something else. And, but it, boy, did it work. Um, and he was dying of cancer of the pancreas. So I had to give him a call and tell him what I just did because I want to make sure I did the right thing. And uh, God, what a conversation that was. And, um, Later in the day, I had a meeting with a company that I had done a tremendous amount of work for and in the construction industry. And um, one of the participants in the meeting who now runs that company told me that her dad wanted to see me afterwards. And so I did. It was not normal. I mean, it was not unnormal for us to get together, especially when new projects were coming up. And um, I was asked... Um, what had happened on a certain job site early in the morning. My answer was, I had nothing to do with your job site. But his answer was, but it was my job site. And so I explained to him what happened. And he said, gee, I didn't know that you missed, you knew Mr. Lorello. And I didn't tell him why, but I said, yeah, it goes back to my military days. And uh, I, I said, uh, why? What happened? This is funny. He goes, well, after you talk to him, from what I'm hearing, and this guy would know, um, he said uh, he sent the two biggest goons he had, and they visited every business agent from New York City, and they're working their way all the way to Maine, and, and even your friend, Scott. And they're telling them, if you even catch a cold when, this is his exact words, because how could you forget something like this? If you even catch a cold while you're working in their jurisdiction, they'll be back to straighten it out. And I was like, found it. I said, I didn't ask him to do that, sir. He goes, I know you didn't, but he did. So he said, next time you have a problem, he said, come see me. Well, knowing what I know, it would have worked both ways. So, um, yeah. So I did my job. I did it right. Um, the reason I got chosen for that honor was because when I transferred into Electronics Command from Forces Command, I ended up working for a 39-year veteran from the agency who told me that his secretary, which I knew, and my aunt were best friends, and they knew that she was his her, aunt, my aunt, my mother's oldest sister, a retired RN. They knew, they knew that she was Crazy Joe Bonanno's mother's nurse, private nurse, and therefore. No one was going to mess with me, so I would be the the emissary to the mafia um, 
embassy. And um, so there were a lot of things, though, I mean, that that uh, ran across my path that I had to use them for. And uh, the people in charge loved it. Let's put it that way. Um, and, of course, when Mr. Comey read some of those files, it kind of blew his mind. And um, so in any event, uh, with that right, that log right up, I had passed it on to someone who I kind of help on certain things when they can't get certain information or whatever, and he does the same thing with me. And um, actually, he's related to my wife, and I worked with his father. So um, he ends up making a phone call, and then, of course, that's what brought Washington in. And after I met with uh, uh, certain members of the Irish establishment, um, on the, 20, the weekend of the 24th of August, 214, um, and gave him a Dear John letter, lecture. Um, uh, everything had been approved and put in place and good plan, and um, I know where the paintings are, they're safe and everything. But gee, who hasn't done their job on this agreement? The FBI. And they know I am pissed. And there's not a thing they can do about it. And they know not to stick their nose in because what happened on my way home from that meeting, um, one of the retired people, see, the deal was you're on your own. You use your own people. You do you do your thing. I said, yeah, I know. Someone else came up in July and told me, go ahead and do it. So um, from another agency who I used to know well. Uh, so I, uh, I don't usually... I, you know, people that have done and do the things that traveling the whole nine yards in this industry, I would call, they don't drive normally. Okay. The speed limit is something that you deal with after you get stopped. And, right. You know, so, so, but, but see, I was in a hurry to get home at 95 miles an hour on 89 because I was supposed to meet up with um, Mr. Comey and his little team. Uh, because they were flying in to meet me and see me. And the thing is, is that some other people were sticking their nose in the business where they shouldn't have, and they delayed our trip, which caused me to have to drive faster to meet the timeline. So, um, and these guys, as good as they are, and they're good men, you know, they just, um, you can't be chauffeured for 10 years and um, drive like I drive. And they um, also probably have gotten rusty in their old age. So, um, I don't know what they were thinking. I was going to bring the paintings home in a Prius. Uh, right. Or was it, <laughs> you know, I just can't. Sometimes I can't wrap around the head of these these uh, the agency decisions, you know, higher ups. Uh, maybe they should try doing the work sometime instead of talking about it. Um, so something happened, with, and it wasn't my fault, okay? It was some crazy guy in a truck that was mowing down the whole miles cones. of cones in a closed lane construction zone, and which he shouldn't have been. And I was waiting to get the first turnaround at the end of the cone so I, should, I could go back down 89 next to the, uh, right across from the, uh, the first welcome center in Vermont when you're traveling north to throw a coat over a baby Peregrine falcon that fell out of the nest and was screaming and flapping his wings, looking up at the nest as we drove by, and he wanted back in. You know, he was in the but back. But he couldn't spot. take off because the car's driving by. By the wind, fast. you know, because he kept on blowing him back and down. So, uh, and we witnessed this. So I said, that's that's bad because I know they, they're raising them in Vermont. Um, they increase population and so they got a good budget on that. And, um, I just, I love animals, okay? So that's what was my plans, and I had Laura hit the, the, the button, and we talked to uh, State Police Dispatcher. Immediately after I found it, I took a mental picture of the mile marker, and I gave her the information, and I told her, you know, if I can, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to need people from your DEC to come and take care of the bird. And she said, great, you know, so... I was waiting for a call back. And so finally, just as we got to the end of the cones, I was going to whip into that, um, and I was traveling, to that turnaround, and this 
crazy bastard was coming up the road doing it was with a big truck. And so, which caused me either, I had two choices, either get broadsided directly on the left or go to the right. And unfortunately, someone was trying to follow me too fast. I couldn't really handle the speed in, the, in this type of maneuvers and drove off into the woods and hit a tree and severed a femoral artery. And if it weren't for the guy who couldn't keep up with me that was behind him, Miles, and came upon the scene, that man saved his life uh, because uh, Louis Free wouldn't have made it. And um, I didn't find this out till later, but as I got up the road, pissed off because I couldn't do what I wanted to do for that baby, Fal Harrigan Falcon, the phone rings and it's a state police dispatcher. And she said, sir, where was that Harrigan Falcon again? So I, I had given her the tenth of a mile mile marker. I had worked on a program that developed that. So I, um, I, I was pissed. So I gave it to her again. I said, why? What's going on? She goes, we just had a terrible accident in that location. I'm thinking, oh, really? That's strange. So we didn't know that we didn't know what happened. happened. So, so we get to South Burlington. We always stop and I get a white chocolate mocha at uh, Barnes, Barnes and Nobles <laughs> and, and something against you know, your wife's wishes. Shame on you. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens is um, on the TV, newsflash, former director of the FBI nearly killed in an accident on I-89. Wow, that's strange, I said to Lord. So I picked the phone, called my contact who arranged this meeting, and I said, hey, check out something for me. And I told him I had just seen the woods. He played dumb. He knew. I can tell you that right now. He knew. I love him, but he knew. He can't fool me. And he knows that. So what happens next is, I said, Laura, so we discuss it and everything, and that's fine. You know, what, what am I going to do? I, I didn't, didn't even know that, that the incident was caused by them. But remember something my mother told me, everything happens for a reason. And there are no coincidences in life. And I always used to think she was crazy. But no, she wasn't. And... Um, so we finally get home late and everything, and I'm not in a good mood and because the delay was their responsibility for sticking their nose in when they said they weren't going to. Now I'm trying to figure out, retired agent, what did these guys think? They were going to cut of the reward or they were going to get, uh, you know, the credit for rescuing the paintings? They didn't even know where the paintings were. I had to tell them where they were. And in fact, in October 2015, I had to tell them that they were going to be moved to Ireland and they didn't do shit. Maybe because another agency said, no, that's not the plan. You keep your nose out of it. I don't know. Not privileged that information. But if I was, that's what I would think. And what happens is they get moved. And I knew it. I knew they were going to move them. Just like I told them, they were stored in Connecticut. <laughs> the reason why they were safe and sound and humidity and temperature controlled. Because you see, when you're an engineer for a pharmaceutical firm, and you build these new facilities, what, you got to have temperature and humidity control with pharmaceuticals. Very important. It's also very important for antiquity paintings. Imagine that. So you make a little space for yourself to store that stuff in. That's genius. That's smart. And the only smart thing they didn't do was they used certain other family members, AMC Javelin, and to rob the museum. You can't get that much stuff in an AMC Javelin hatchback, okay? One of the things I got that was, and this has happened all my life, is the odd statement. Say it once, I'll file it, thinking it, maybe, maybe it's important, maybe it's not. But say it twice, and in a conversation, I had nothing, it came out of the blue, and the looks to each other on their faces and the, and the smirk smile, like, I know something you don't, was one of the things that got them. So, and I, my mind is like a video machine, uh, because all these things, these incidents, and all these cases, is like, I can, I can, I don't even have to close my eyes to hear the conversation and to see the conversation. It's, it's insane. So, um, I do understand now, but I had no idea then. So um, that on top of 
a bunch of other things, uh, especially when the tremendous singer who um, who ordered the hit on me, the older brother, because I gave a legal work assignment for a product that was used just about exclusively by the government and being raped terribly by Nanville for doing so because if not only uh, not only were they avoiding $8 million landfill costs, but they were charging them $5 a square foot for something that probably caught. Well, when you take the negative out of it on your budget, in other words, you're avoiding the $8 million, I mean, you can afford to give that product away. But no, true to American corporate capitalism, they were going to rape the government, and they did. And they did worse than that because, see, this company went, it was called Manville, and, and they partnered with me to run this division because they got in trouble and they lost, went from 100% market share to about 26% market share. We solved a couple of problems for them, and then they came to me and wanted me to go to work for them, uh, especially when I, I had like about 10 projects going down in Orlando with the paving stone. And these guys show up in two vans and said, hey, we got to talk to you. We want you to go to work for us. I'm thinking, really stick with me for the next eight hours and tell me why I have to. I should even consider your proposal because I, I got to think about big corporations because in my line of work, you find out too much. So boom, they followed me. They realized. Hmm. So they, they stayed for like nearly the entire week. Uh, there's only one guy I really liked and, and he was a lawyer and he was VP of the division and he, we hit it off. And so I said, look at, um, you know, I want to continue to talk. They're going home. Stay at my house. I had a, a built a new home in um, West End of Lake Butler and living alone. And I had three spare bedrooms on the other side of the house. So he came and we spent the weekend together and we made some progress and everything. And I said, well, before I decide anything, I'm going to fly home and talk to my father and my lawyer. And my lawyer was Jim Brooks in Lake Placid, one hell of a man. Um, and both of them, both of them gave me the same advice, but, you know, being young and being dangled with this big job, um, decided that, okay, well, how about if I partner with you for doing this and here's the deal and this is what I want. And well, I should have been, I should have been suspicious when they took it in an instant, right? So. We moved the running of this division out of the um, Denver office and I set up an office in Orlando, hired my own people, some people that worked for both the companies because they were that good. And we, um, with between, that it was in June when we started and by Christmas time, we went from 26% market share and we were up to, I think, uh, about 90 some percent market share. It was over 90%, I know that. Um, and that's when you got a cash cow like that, uh, that's a big jump. So, um, the product is used on, it's a non-slip surface that's used on the bridge of ships. It's used in munition factories, but it's used in just about every post office and general mail and air mail facility that the U S post office has. The unfortunate thing with Manville is that after the uh, next year, when we sold out five years worth of production, they decided it would be nicer to come to me and try to convince me to get rid of all my people and to double my uh, obnoxious salary for 20 hours a week. Uh, and uh, I had an um, embarrassing expense account. I never abused it, uh, but I made use of it. Um, so that's what they wanted me to do, and I was really offended because these people left good jobs to come to work for me, and they did, they made it happen. It's just like in the Paving Stone. I didn't get to do the work at Disney World and Universal Studios and City of Orlando and every major corporate center because I did it by myself. No, I had really good men and women off the farms in northern New York, got them in the union, and they did well, but they earned every cent of it. And... I still get compliments when we go to Orlando from the people that we worked with because they told my wife the first time they met her that no one, no company has ever matched what we did. So um, I started off with a certain philosophy. Um, I'm very well educated. 
Because when you don't have to pay for your education, you can just keep on going and going and going. <laughs> and that's what I did. I took advantage of that. And um, so I'm a truck. I'm a Druckerian, Peter Drucker, you know, style manager. Uh, got that in the MBA program at Clarkson. And I also designed computer systems. But um, the point is, Drucker says, surround yourself with excellence. And that's what I tried to do. And that's what I did. And these people, I, I love them. Every time we run into some of them, they want to go back to work tomorrow. Um, he treated them well. Right. They, it, it was an agreed operation. To me, the most important thing was to, when you're handed the most prestigious job in the world, is to treat it that way and to your work has to be. Unfortunately, with Disney, they went through a time where they got MBAers in and uh, TV Lundy and their group of Buena Vista Construction, which I hear now is back, kind of lost control of things. And these MBAers were going to save Disney a lot of money. Man, I can tell you stories that you would laugh your butt off about, especially for the fact that there were three things they wanted changed on my project. And I said, only if you, because the contract was signed, if you giving me a letter absolving me of all responsibility. Well, all three things came back to bite him in the ass big time. Um, I knew my work. I set off to uh, we we cre- we created the demand and the surge uh, for interlocking paving stones to be used widely in the United States as they were being used in Europe. I mean, think of the Appian Way, which is still used today. Basically, that's a paving stone road, but this is even more sophisticated. Um, because you've got, especially in Florida, with that hot weather and sunshine, you have built-in expansion and contraction and no heaving of concrete slabs and no melting of asphalt, which I have seen several times in the South. So Disney made the right choice. Uh, in 85, I met with Bill Cohen, the head landscape architect, and that put me on the path of being chosen to do that new entrance in the Magic Kingdom for the big buses. Um, we had done work previously before that down there, but not as big. And um, so what happened with Bill is I ended up stealing him from Disney. And um, I can remember him when I gave him his first check on one job that he did for me. Um, he looked at it and he said, Scott, this is more money than I make all year for Disney. So I said, well, get used to it. Because, you know, when you're working in Fairfield County and Westchester County and places like that, where there's money uh, in uh, uh, Weston, uh, um, and I'm got, we've got a lot of connection with that. Now. Um, for people that are quite wealthy, quite famous, and uh, something new and exciting and beautiful comes along like this, well, one neighbor has to outdo the other. But we were doing major projects for Tishman, Turner, Vappy, and Fusco, and a few other large firms, BBL at Albany, um, I forgot. There's some jobs I I had such good people. There are some jobs that I never even went to. So um, we were busy. We lived way up. Uh, this was my first wife and I. We lived up in Camp, New York. We had we had to move out of the village because of expanding business, and we bought a good sized old farm. But just you know, it was not a working farm except for the fact that I. I uh, had Angus uh, Charlet cattle, and we inseminated them with Angus semen from Cornell Labs. And we, my wife at the time was a, also an animal lover, so we had, let me see, rabbits, goats, sheep, horses, the cattle, um, capons, chickens, um, <laughs> uh, everyone's cat that they wanted to drop off and get rid of. <laughs> Um, uh, that was a heartbreaking thing to have to deal with. Um, so I was traveling seven hours, okay, from Camp New York to the work on the coast in Connecticut. I mean, at the minimum. And sometimes I would do go back and forth twice a week. So um, it got a little tiring and it became concerned. So that's why I decided to find one big place where they would use a lot of this stuff and it turned out to be or Orlando. And, um, and the reason that the company that had the license to make those 
built a plant in Orlando because they needed an order for a million square feet and they got it. So, um, which made it really nice. Um, in 89, I, uh, because of, of, of my relationship with Bill Cohen, who is now president of ITAC, um, he brought me in on the Orlando um, arena job as a consultant because he had known my work and, um, you know, I, I would fly him up to, to deal with certain things. And so what happened is um, it made sense to Bill, smart man. He wouldn't be where he is right now if he wasn't really smart. And uh, I was specced into the job. A lot of people didn't know that my neighbor across the street's wife and Mike Eisner's wife were sorority sisters at St. Lawrence University. So Mike made sure he knew what he was doing and he used the right channels. And then they, for a year, they investigated our work. I used to fly people in. I used to have to bring them to my customers. Couldn't sit in on the meetings or anything. And so that's how I got the job. Uh, I, uh, the general on the job, uh, did, you know, the big stuff, the uh, buildings and the curbing and all that stuff was uh, a guy named Farrah Construct- Gary Farrah from Farrah Construction. They were out of Michigan, and he found a home at Disney for a long, long time. But things changed, and I think he works for Disney now if he's still alive. Um, so, you know, when all you when you start plugging all these things, and some, there was so much that happened in Orlando. I mean, at times we were working twenty four seven on several projects, and so that wasn't much of a trade. You dress seven hours to that type of life, you know. But it was fun. My first wife and I had separated. It was fun. Uh, it gave me a lot of growth. Uh, I met a lot of great, great people, including Steven Spielberg, who gave me complete artistic freedom at Universal Studios because I caught something that his people, his artists did that was an embarrassing mistake before the public could see it. And that that story right there is so funny how it happened. It's unreal, but I, I don't think that's necessary to get into. Um, but... <laughs> Maybe another time. Maybe another time. So, <laughs> so in any event, so I spent those years down here, there, and then uh, things change with the industry down there. You know, things dry up. But see, Manville's problem is uh, instead of trying to settle this with me, they just pulled their funding. So I said, they said, we'll settle on the courtroom steps. And uh, this is how dumb they can be. All the sales contracts were in my name. I had a board member call me who didn't like what they were doing. And that person told me the reason they all did this was because somehow they forgot in their 87 bankruptcy allocution to tell the federal judge and the federal government that, hey, all those millions and millions and millions of square feet that we sold you contained asbestos. Now, there was a way of treating this material where you wouldn't have a problem. But they didn't pursue that at all. They just let it happen. So I didn't like that at all. So when I went to a meeting, like at the Philadelphia post office, where we were going to have a big job, I told them, I told the guy there, the head guy, the postmaster, I made it perfectly clear because that's not the way you do things. So uh, I flew up to Washington, had a little meeting with some people in Washington and, uh, Manville had to get out of that business. So their greed, thinking that they were going to pull this shit because their cash cow became a golden goose, um, turned into the fact that they could no longer deal in that business. And some people should have went to jail. If it would have been up to me, they would have. Because you just don't do that to people. And that just shows you the state we have gone in this world in this country where corporations can decide the value of your life basically that's simplistic but it's true so the last two weeks in orlando everywhere i go i got a couple of walt gallagher's men walt gallagher's former cia he was the orange county sheriff then he was handed some stuff when i was down there i don't i can't get into that now uh, and I don't think I, I could because that's not the agreement that I have. Um, but it's it, it just every every one of these things were solved and given to them 
with everything they needed to do it because I wasn't going to court. That's your goddamn joke. I've been shot before. I know what it's like. So what happens is, um, so they start being more involved in getting when I shouldn't have. So instead of staying on target, I'm doing these things for these other people and these other agencies, including the DEA. Um, so, and of course, what better place than Florida in those times? Um, so what happens is those two men, in those two squad cars were following me, were following me because they knew the Irish mob was trying to find me and kill me. So when I get home, I'm home two days, staying with my parents and Tupper Lake, where I was born, in my childhood home, because my father had had a stroke and my mother needed a break of taking care of him, and all of us took, well, most of us took turns helping her out, but I also had to come up, because this bullet that had been in my head since 69, that's another story that's going to hurt some people soon, um, I got in an accident, someone rear-ended me, and it actually dislodged the location of the bullet, and the bullet started traveling in my head, and when it would hit a certain nerve, I didn't care if I lived or died. It was so bad. And I don't know why they didn't catch it in Orlando, but I had a friend, a very good friend, uh, who I knew from DEA days that um, was had a very responsible uh, position in one of – she was beautiful, too – in, a, in a, uh, one of Arnold Palmer's hospitals down there, and she knew the right doctors, so I had, I had the best doctors down there. And they missed it, and they thought it was a brain tumor. And so they suggested that I go and see this doctor in Burlington who became an expert in it because he had a brain tumor, and it was removed properly, and he, I think he's still alive, and um, he was the man to see about such things, according to these doctors. And so that was second uh, one of three reasons I was home. I think everything seems to have three things to it, three reasons, but... Um, phone rings 10.15 on Tuesday morning and it's someone who who really knows I made his career and um, because we had a good relationship then I decided that he was, he was the one that was to be given the information first um, how do you know John Gotti and I said Tim I, I don't want to use the language but I, I met him at a union function in Connecticut for a friend of mine who was a business agent. His brother was dying. His brother was my labor steward at the, the largest job in the world at the time, Long Wharf in New Haven, for Fusco Corporation. And I said there was a fundraiser, and it was $5,000 a plate. And I took my whole crew there because this man was so good to us. As, I, as Even though we were all union, we came into their territory and – we did what we wanted to do, and that's work extended hours and use, you know, we had operating engineer books. We had Mason's books. We had electrician's books, and but mainly we all carried labor's books because the local labor's union gave me work a week after I graduated from high school and basically gave me work all the way through college anytime I needed it. And so they asked for the legal work assignment on paving stone. I gave it to them. They asked for the legal work assignment on the asphalt plank, I gave it to them. No one else asked for it. I controlled it, and that's your right. So I had the lawyer fill out the documents, and they were sent in. Well, years go by, and the two largest jobs in the world that we knew were coming up, and we had sold the product to for this project, these projects, were in the west side of New York City in the jurisdiction, and then it was another place in the city where the Irish rub, Irish mob run Carpenter's Union, the enemy of John Gotti, because uh, John shot little John O'Connor in the ass in 85 and got away with it. Um, so they kind of bickered about work. And so what happens is um, I met him there. That's all. You know? I knew a lot about him, but it wasn't my concern. If I'm doing something else, that's what my, my job is to do with that direction. It's not pay attention to this guy. So I, that's what I said, you know, and um, I said, why? And as soon as he said, oh, don't worry about it, then I knew 
something was up. That wasn't a typical answer from him. You see, John got a, got, a, got a call from Mike Lorello's people. Mike died in 89, a cancer of the pancreas, never went to jail, did get indicted on that famous RICO case, USA versus LIUNA, Labor International Union of North America, et al. And et al. were all um, mafia chief pins in the country. So, and I know why. And I, I know why. No, I, it's not, I don't, I know why they got indicted. So, um, Mike died, but apparently he left instructions that nothing ever better happened to me. He must have really respected me. Thank God he did. Because John was ordered to have these two men sign up to protect me. One of them was my labor steward on a uh, big job in Newark for the federal government. Carried a pistol open in a holster in a federal facility. And I always had one weapon or another on me. But what's this guy doing? Carrying a pistol like a cowboy in this big federal facility. And no one says a word to him. Imagine that. So, and that was because the carpenters were making waves about, well, the Irish were making waves about the fact that the laborers were being able to get all this money and not the carpenters. And, of course, that means also stealing their benefits, right? So they got jealous because about $500 million worth of work ended up in their jurisdiction, and they weren't going to get a taste. Oh, why is that? Well, this guy gave the legal work assignment to the other guys, really. So well, let's really kill all them. business. All business. Know? It wasn't personal. They didn't know so me or anything. They put a head out they, on him. They put a head out on me, and that's the conversation. That's what happened. So... Uh, the other order was uh, the two guys who were trying to find me and kill me who were running the Carpenters Union. Um, had to go bye-bye, and they did. I think one body so far is recovered. Not my business. Uh, right. I don't care. <laughs> the less you know, the better off. I didn't know years that. later. Yeah, it took a couple of years to come out. So, so the whole reason I'm telling you this story is because of this connection thing, and people have to think about this. How did... Nine, Years ago, the wedding. Oh, uh, yeah, it was about that. About nine years ago, my oldest son brings my oldest daughter to Boston to work for him, and she was making good money. And after a little while, she met someone, and they fell in love on site. And uh, he was good, he's a good man. He uh, was a Fury Court officer, and he owned a famous bar in uh, Waltham, Boston Line called Jocko's, and it's, uh, it's an Irish bar. Needless to say. And um, so they get married, and we had Hotel Marlowe in Cambridge and for a week. And 117 came over from the family overseas. From Ireland. 116 from Ireland, one from New Zealand. and But one of them never, never came near me. But he had a lot of invitations, a lot of guests at my daughter's wedding. And, wow, he was the star of the reception. Imagine that. Until the Sunday after the wedding when we had a family-only party in my daughter's bar and her other bar and restaurant. And after he got up and sang two beautiful songs because he should have went into that business full-time, but I know it doesn't pay well. But, I mean, this guy is professional. That's how good he is. He comes to... I was still having surgery on medication. I couldn't drink, so I'm watching a soccer game at the end of the bar. Comes and he sits next to me on the left-hand side. I didn't look at him or anything because I was enthralled in the game. And But I looked down in his right hand, and his right hand has got fingers about 50-cent size pieces. You would want to if you're leading the Irish mob. And he's shaking, so the kindness in me said must be Parkinson's or MS. Until he looked at me, and said, Scott, what happened? And then everything went, yep. okay, there's the last clue that I need. So I told him what happened, period. And why? He gets up and he taps me on the shoulder and he goes, that's okay. That's okay? You were going to kill me? I can understand, you know, how they do it because it's, it's business, it's not personal. And it wasn't personal. It was over the loss of that income. But it cost them more than that. And why? He didn't lose his job. They lost control of the carpentry. They disbanded the local. So um, 
wow, you think that they would have they would have learned like in eighty seven when I was home when the market fell in the office and the phone rang and it was my Disney project manager and he said, Scott, we got a problem. And so first thing I thought out of my mouth was, what'd you do? Cancel my project? You know, I just said it sarcastically. Because no, that's funded. Don't worry about that. I said, okay, so what's our problem? Well, he says, we got a problem here because a project didn't go union at Epcot. And the Irish labor leaders, because he, Florida's an open shop. So, you know, Whoever gets there first and sets up and survives, I guess, can run their scam. And uh, he says, um, the Irish labor leaders over here with their men and they're turning over cars and setting them on fire. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, Tom, how's that my problem? Well, he said, you know, when we investigated you uh, for that year, um, all the customers said the same thing. I mean, not only did you, you – more than deliver what you said and you were ahead of schedule and you helped everyone on the job and all that thing. He said, but they all said, it's funny, he can walk into any jurisdiction of the union and with his own people and go to work and have to even go to the business. I did out of courtesy, but I didn't have to. And I developed great relationships with some people who ended up in federal prison. That's not my problem. It wasn't my point. I was doing a specific thing and that's what I had to pay attention to. So, but he didn't have to use their local union people. People, it was all my people from my northern That's New York. Not typical. Not typical anywhere. Um, but we would once in a while just to keep, uh, especially the 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 balance that you like to see in a job between minorities and females. So, we, at times we had female our own females working with us, but they had families up here, and, and it wasn't easy to be traveling all the time and working, especially in Florida. And then you had these other, you know, things. So we would take these people, and they all turned out to be absolutely wonderful people, great workers. Because when you have guys off the farm in northern New York, when they get nervous because they're only working eight, I mean, 10 or 12 hours a day because of the life that they were used to, then they would, you know, they were very grateful. I mean, just for the most part, I mean, you have to weed out the ones that, that get used to it and then slack, but that, you know, the core did their own weeding. In other words, someone started, they got on them to either pick up the slack and, and everybody do their part or they got rid of them. And that's one of the things about the drug carrier thing. If you're going to surround yourself with excellence, then you can't nitpick and micromanage manage everything like that. It's, it's, and, and, and that's how, I, I, that's what I learned. It made perfect sense to me, and that's the way we ran things. And that's why we know. We do have to go to our first musical break. Okay. And okay. on this break, we have Griff from Toronto, Canada with Let Freedom Ring. We also have Michaela Hay, who is from Ontario, Canada, and she actually graduated this year, but she's very talented. Uh, if you ever want to check her out on YouTube, she's got many music videos as well. But she'll be singing W You Know, Nothing But Blood, as well as Close. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. Sense in common, it's kind of ironic. My freedom, I recently bought it. Now I'm a target. If I do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, come on, man, let freedom ring. The 
states become divided states. The world is filled with all kinds of shades. And still, and still resegregate. Parents separate from the children. That's not okay. We should be free to laugh and play. Do it now before you pass away. Fight for what's right. Enough for everybody to get peace of the pie. Greenwash, social media, full of lies. Go to work, pay bills, then you die. Need a break away. Guns, get rid of the AKs. Our ancestors paved way since the slave days, but we still hurting. Carry that burden. Stop playing victim. Beat the system. Love is love. It should be shown. Can't grow unless you leave your comfort zone. This I know. I learned all this from the mentorship. Kids don't know what independent is. Take advantage what your parents did. Go against the grid. You have to. Like going to the bathroom. Learn the right songs. Cause of Matthew. Liberty like statue. They call now the present. Cause it's a gift. It should be cherished. Last name fearless. Not Harris. All thanks to my parents' parents. Now, love the last name every time that I hear it. Cause I know what it represents. Climb the fence. So now I got freedom. Such a beautiful thing. Freedom. Such a wonderful thing. Thing, thing, thing. Freedom. Such a beautiful thing. Freedom. Such a wonderful thing. Thing, thing, thing. Stone 
There's too much sky, too blue, too white The birds on the wire are singing, but I don't know why Why aren't the roses hanging their heads? They're standing straight up Blooming instead Now that we're apart There's nothing But blood in my heart Why does that guy Have a smile on his face Why is the sun even shining today? Why are the headlines talking about love? Don't they all know what happened to us?
Welcome back, and thanks so much for joining us tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. Tonight, we are joined by Scott and Lara Varden. Welcome back, and thanks so much for hanging out with us and sharing your stories. You're back. Um, what, I'm going to get back to um, about that phone call in 87 from my project manager from Disney, because that's this is how about this connection stuff. And also, it's going to prove another point, is that you are not allowed to remember until your visitors know it's the time for you to get all this stuff and put it in perspective. And that's basically what's happened here. So the so he tells me what's going on and the cars being turned, turned over, over and setting on fire and stuff like that. And they're really in a tibby because they've never had, of course, something like that happening at Disney World, right? So, um, so when I asked him, Again, you know, how is that my problem? He said, well, because you could do these things, so you know someone. And I never thought about it in that way, but I instinctively made a phone call to someone who I really liked and would, I, I liked how he treated us. I never asked for a thing because in that business, it's kind of hard for people not to do that to you. But uh, he held an important position but in, in the labor union. But um, unfortunately... Uh, he made some bad choices, and he ended up going to federal prison like his father. So uh, that's the person I called, but he wasn't in the office. So I got one phone with Disney on the line on hold and pick up the other phone and make this phone call to this person. And he's not there, but he's up in a place in Rhode Island where I know a bunch of people went after Mr. Giuliani, gave him a hard time. And so hmm, that's strange. No, not really. So he... The guy in the office says, you want to sell? I go, sure. So, cell phone. So I call him in the cell, and I explain to him what was just explained to me at Disney and the fact that, hey, we're going in there, you know, and this is a big thing. And uh, they obviously, if they called me, they need help on something. And I didn't totally understand what was going on, nor the relationship with the Irish-run labor union. And it's not just the Irish, because I don't want to give the Irish a, bi- a bad name. There's Irish mob and labor So um, he goes, well, you're in luck. And I said, why is that? I'm not going to name the names, but you could figure it out. Because across the table from my friend were the two most important people in the labor union in the world. And he said, tell them. So now I got all kinds of people on the phone and I explained to them the problem and how they asked me if I could help them. And they said, yeah, hold on. Then I got two phones on hold. Well, they're open lines, but and I start talking to my Disney friend about other things because we had some other things in common. He was from Barry, Vermont. In fact. And so we knew people together. And so, we, you know, just, we were, all, we were friends from day one. In fact, he built my home in, in Orlando. Um, or actually, it was uh, not Orlando. What's the Windermere. name? Windermere. Windermere. Yeah, yes. it was Windermere. So um, all of a sudden, someone comes in his office and is talking to him. And naturally, he stopped talking to me. And then the next thing out of his mouth is, gee, thanks, Scott. I'm thinking, what's that for? He said, why? What's up? He goes, well. The guy just came in and told me, he said, uh, two vans with, he said, full of goons, which means big, strong men in cheap suits, um, showed up and beat the shit out of the labor union, got leaders and threw them in the van and uh, got control of the mob and made them clean everything up. And you know what? They paid off everyone's damage in cash. So I'm thinking... Wow, that's strange. <laughs> <laughs> One little phone call telling some of my problems and that happens. Really not. Because, see, a guy named Mr. Trafficante got a phone call, and Mr. Trafficante sent some people over to try to help things out, <laughs> and they did. So imagine that. Irish mob run labor union in Orlando got spanked. <laughs> They did not know why until I gave them a, a long, a long report there after the, after uh, the meeting, written report, and um, 
So, uh, yeah. So, so as a joke, um, can we swear on this yes, line? Yes, you may. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so I said, I, I mean, we had a good relationship. So just as a joke, I said, well, you owe me, motherfucker. Just as a joke, you know. And he goes, the next thing out of his mouth was, I think this is insider trading, but I don't know. That wasn't my expertise. And he goes, Disney stock's going to 1325 on Tuesday. Mortgage the farm and buy it. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> of course, I didn't do that because I didn't have to mortgage the farm. But um, it turned out to be quite a good decision um, because, man, did that thing split three for one so many times. Make your head spin. And But I guess my ex-wife needed it more than I did, so it got liquidated. I got a little chunk of it, but um, it's funny how things work like that. Someone shows their appreciation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so life goes on, right? Back to the phone call in 94. I didn't know that there was a relationship, you know, and, and I really at that time did not know that the Irish mob was trying to find me and kill me because I gave that legal work assignment away. And, um, but I did find out, like I find out everything eventually. And uh, so then comes wedding time and we had this big, big get together and he sits down next to me, the guy who was trying to kill me. Uh, oh, by the way, Mr. Comey told me I couldn't, I couldn't. I had to stay within the law because he knew they tried to kill me. And, of course, not knowing that I never even drew my weapon in all those years because I treated you never people. You never had to. Never had to. If you treat people right and you do your job right and you say, sit down with them and say, look, this is what I have. This is what I have. This is what I have. You can say what you want in your statement, but this is what the judge is going to and the prosecutor are going to get. And, boy, it's pretty solid. And so you got a choice. Either fess up. Explain your situation. Get lenience. And, yeah, and, you know, put yourself in a position where he's going to say, "Well, this guy maybe learns his lesson, or whatever." And so they would sign, they would sign the confession, time after time after time, to the point where the sack got ordered in the Newark office to send down some men to talk to the station chief to find out how the hell is he doing this? What's he doing? Threatening in their lives? You know, that's how they think. That's how they think that you have to have results by doing that to people. By forcing that. Forcing that. So, so they got to sit. It, they got to witness a, a a really major case that I had serendipitously solved. Laura says that I'm a sin eater because people get in this situation and I confront them, and out of their mouth comes every answer possible, and then they clam up. But it's too late. You know, we had the evidence, and then they admit it. And, of course, come with me, electronics, man, you never record anything. So, uh, <laughs> the electronics command morphed into NSA. NSA. You so, probably are listening that tonight. very facetiously. So, uh, <laughs> and so when you make friends of electronics command that go on to the NSA, and worse than that, go on to being in charge of computer program security at Microsoft, who, when we all got together on a trip to Alaska in what year? 95? Yeah, the year after my dad yeah. died. 95, because my dad made me promise to go to Alaska, something he never got to do. Um, and the guy says, hey, yeah, I remember. And he says, here's my card. And by the way, we got a backdoor in every piece of software. <laughs> Makes sense. I would too. Okay? I mean, you know, um, well... You really, you, you, you really wouldn't have to have these things and do these things if you really treated other people right and you treated them as equal and you didn't try to steal their resources for corporate greed because you got to have more toys at the end of the game. You wouldn't have to spend all this money on bombs and missiles and ships because you're pissing people off all over the world by exporting your freedom, which in turn really is corporatization of their assets, their resources. So, you know, you get what you give. You get and, what you give. And Scott so, has always, well, we both have always believed that 
we we all should be in service to others. You know, that's how we live our lives, to help others. And he has said that if if everyone did that, we wouldn't have these problems. Because someone would have your back. But no, that's not the way we are because we are off, way off the path of the purpose of life. If people only knew the truth of what was going on um, and what's going on underground in these facilities and these bases and the agreements that we have with off planet life um, and who it's benefiting and why and what they know and what they prepared for and what they think of the value of your life. Um, things probably uh, would be worse than they are now with the people not putting up with bullshit. But that's not the way things are. People are too easily distracted. They're programmed beyond belief. I just cannot believe what some people believe, and they'll sit there and listen to someone tell them something and think, oh, that's got to be true because this person is this person. Oh, really? Look at your history books and then dig deep. Dig deep into ancient documents. Why do these people like Sitchin and Hapgood and and uh, all these other people, uh, uh, the guys who wrote Forbidden Archaeology, how come the establishment in those areas try to ruin their lives after they reveal the truth? Okay, because, you know, everybody wants their piece of the pie and their comfortableness and they don't want it. They don't want any waves in the pool. Well, that's all coming to a very abrupt end. As we know, disclosure is here, as half-assed as it is, and I have been warning them that you have to come clean with everything and, you know, ask for forgiveness. Now, there, was, there was a reason why you were doing it, which you thought was the right reason. It turns out it wasn't. But So don't, don't make it worse and don't play the games and don't try to ruin people's lives or kill people which has happened and hurt people, um, you know, and then you won't have to go to, to uh, Watts and apologize to the people at Watts for causing the crack a- academic because you thought you were doing the right thing by stopping communism in Nicaragua, which I think is a bunch of bullshit to begin with anyways. And so you got to finance this because Frank Church and the boys and what they called the Greeks kind of made laws that made your Illegal operations are using funded money, taxpayer-paid money, for things that were supposedly forbidden. So you find another way to, because you think you're doing right, you find another way to accomplish this. And that's what happened with the cocaine trade. Because I can name you the three guys who flew the weapons in. And, oh, surprise, you're bringing something home. And it was a surprise for them. They're, They're all good men. I know him very, very well. One of them has passed away since then. He was a New York State, what we call a rotary pilot, New York State trooper. Imagine his surprise. But I knew where they were and what they were doing. And I let it be known that anything happened to them, then someone's going to deal with me. And they, um, when they got home, they came and saw me. And they were worried. And I said, you don't have to worry. You know, that's it. So um, they were all New York Air National Guard pilots, all New York State employees. But, you know, like, case there's someone in my family who I'm the godfather for that did all those flights into Antarctica, too. So don't tell me what's really going on in Antarctica because I know. But I, I know not just because of family. I know because of, of other things that. People would not understand how you can get from point A to point B and not anyone else knowing about it and witnessing stuff. So, whatever. Um, So that's what's got us to this position. Uh, Humanity is so far far off the path of life. It's ridiculous. Okay? I'm going to get back to the Irish because i got to defend them in this. Because one of the conversations I had with my friends was... You know, you know, I'll be honest with you. I like them. I know what they tried to do. I like them as human beings. I like the time that I've spent with them. They're funny. They're fun. The whole nine yards. I don't agree with doing what they did. 
but people should think about something. And I had some, I had to pull some shit on my friends who were trying to play and run there in Boston. Um, and the answer is this. When America wanted to get rid of the British, we went to the French to finance our revolution. We didn't have a pot to piss in. Well, guess what? The Irish want to get rid of the British too. Who wants to be ruled by a queen and king? I mean, God, what insanity is that? I just cannot wrap my head around it. Um, you're not royal man. You're just another woman. And some people say you're not really a woman either. You might be another species. I've heard that story more than once. Um, but the point is they had no one. So these two young men thought they were going to help their their country, their fellow countrymen, to get rid of the British. So they had to go fundraising. And I know for a fact who, when, where, and what overheard a conversation in a bar. Said, hey, maybe that's maybe that's the pot at the end of the rainbow. So let's look into it. But when you have a Boston cop who's your gambling debt enforcer, get this. Who gave them the uniforms, lent, lent them the uniforms, and died on my wife's uncle's crap table in an Irish mob casino in Las Vegas. Who yeah, said, that cop who was the one who gave, gave them the uniforms to get into the museum. Into the garden. What about that connection? Isn't, that, isn't it a little strange that I would get to interview him and and hear the story? Okay, and what is strange that it's her mother's youngest brother uh, who set up their internet gambling operations and got out when they passed new laws that made him also criminally responsible. Hey, he had to survive. He had to live the whole nine yards. I'm not going to judge. So um, everything is connected. Everything. And um, so uh, things things go on, okay? So after that meeting and after he came up here to see me in the whole nine yards, you know, I, I had already put everything that was agreed to by the other people and him. I don't care if he want, doesn't want people to know it or anything. It's the only way to get the paintings back. And But other people want to seem that they want to make their career on punishing these people. Well, they can't. They can't do it without my knowledge, and they'll never get it because I won't do that. They agreed to everything. They make out better financially. It's none of my business. My business is to get those paintings back into the garden. Okay? But he totally understands why. why? And that's the whole it. key. If you, if you can't understand why, what... What's the motive? What causes people to to do these things and then, you know, verify it. And, and so you understand that it makes, it makes your work so much easier to deal with the situation where you don't have to go in with blazing guns and everything else. You say, look it. Okay. You won statute of limitations were five, not a material support, but even though something happened to make the movie script, which I have control over, because I get the movie and the book rights out of this deal, plus they had to raise the reward to $10 million. But they're not getting the paintings back till the FBI does their job. And soon, the governor of New York State, who knew about this in, in the spring of 2015, the superintendent of state police, are going to have a choice to make. They do the job that the FBI is dragging their feet on, they have no reason to because geez, uh, maybe a week or 10 days after the agreement, they were got permission. Get this. They didn't know that they could monitor my equipment because I gave them permission to because that's a law in New York State. One person only has to acquiesce. So I had to convince them of that to look into law books. And, um, oh, shit, he was right. So let's do it. And I can show you the number and the setup and everything. And so they got a confession. They, had, they got everything they needed to lock this case up. Some very bad people who sh were in the justice system did some very bad things and it cost a person his life. And that's just a, that's just a tip. And it was all because two of the people 
suckered in all the rest for their own personal vendetta. And they didn't realize that everything they were saying and doing became evidence, was recorded. Because these little babies right here can be your best friend or your worst enemy. So um, I just bided my time, bided my time, bided my time. I still participated and helped them out, not the same people, but the people I had been used to working with. And uh, then it came the opportunity for me to do the right thing, to expose these people for what they did. Um, I'm not, uh, it's going to cost them some money because it costs some people a lot of money and a lot of other things. So that's, they got to make the house right. There's no question about that. Um, under the new law in New York State, they could all lose their pensions. Now, me, imagine being a, a, being so dumb, this organization. Once these people did this, two of the key people who were involved in this orchestration of injustice were made a major from a captain to a major, which greatly raised uh, retirements for maybe like a month and then they retired. And then some other people got these important opportunities and one became a Supreme Court judge. And unfortunately for him, it was his father who gave us a recorded confession. And because I told his father that, gee, you know, if you would have told me, being a father myself, if you would have told me what was going on, Jim, it wouldn't have went that far. My target was, was not these two women on top of these men who had a very, well, you know, like when you're in a position to cause very something. Cryptic. Maybe she gives me details. Okay. When you're, when you're a teacher. And you're a superintendent of schools. You have no right being caught at a favorite suite of home in the middle of the night with a bunch, well, with everybody being naked, including a bunch of underage girls. High schoolers. And having a state yeah. trooper, having a state trooper catch them, bring the girls home, and then start doing it himself. And trying to bury everything. But unfortunately for some of the other people in the community who were very well respected and just great people and who were friends of the family came to me that same awful week of the John Gotti call and said, we need help. We have daughters. This has been going on for a long time. Yeah, I know. Cause I witnessed it in seventh grade. So they said, we know you can do something about it. And I listened to them and I thought about it. And, you know, I had a daughter. I had two daughters now that I raised. Um, and so I made the phone call. I brought internal affairs up. And they did their thing and some people paid the price. But not the price they should have paid. Okay? So, um, and so these people who actually were one way or another related to these female teachers that I didn't know about that were doing it. But unfortunately, one got caught in a video with three underage boys at the same time. So it doesn't leave much of the imagination. Yeah. And uh, so someone proved that to me. And so, yeah, that's not right. Um, yeah, we're, we, we may have been genetically engineered to be fruitful and multiply, but you have to use your head in that deal. And a lot of people don't. Um, it's sad it's with how we've deteriorated, especially to something as precious as youth that can be so vulnerable. So I brought him up and I had, then I found out about the other two and um, talked to people, interviewed people that, that felt that they were forced to do it. You know, I'm, I was a teenager once. I may have had one opportunity from one teacher, but I know a lot of the guys that did and took advantage of it. And, um, but I didn't, I can honestly say that I didn't, not that I didn't want to, but I didn't. Um, the family was, the first sergeant can be very strict in a household. So 
I brought them in because they asked me to and I felt it was the right thing. And then so these people bided their time and took a, the dumbest opportunity to try to come back at me because it wasn't even in the law and they got caught. So they had to retreat with a recording, leaving the courtroom, this idiot tells me, who became a Supreme Court judge. If you don't stop what you're doing, we're going to find something else to invite you on. I said, oh, really? Thank you. Um, that's how dumb they are. Um, so, okay, let's see where this goes. So they pulled their shit again and they brought in other people. I mean, you're talking jury tampering. You're talking uh, false testimony. You're talking false um, stenography records. Uh, it's just unbelievable how dumb they were that they kept on compounding their problem. And now... They really wanted to kill his reputation. They really, actually, they really wanted to kill me, okay? Because, so, with the shit that they pulled, I had to go somewhere for a little while, and then something happened where someone sucker punched me in, a, in an environment where he shouldn't have, so he got hit once, and he lived two minutes and 45 seconds. And no one could do a fucking thing. So they buried it under another false pretense of something else happening to this person. But because a certain person in, uh, who was in charge of that facility immediately told me, don't worry, you, you've got them. We know what they're doing. Okay? So for me, it was rough on the family, but I don't know, kind of was kind of like fun in a way. I kinda, maybe that's sick, but it, uh, I don't like anybody getting hurt or anything. But you can't put yourself in an environment that – someone does something and then it puts you in such a vulnerable position because you did nothing about it. Well, when you're reading something and someone punches you, you, you naturally, at least the way that I was trained, you move a certain way. And unfortunately that blow stopped his heart. So, but he shouldn't have hit me, you know, plain and simple. It wasn't, I try, I didn't try to hurt him, the man at all. It was just a natural reflex. So um, now they got to deal with that because I'm sure, I'm sure his widow and his family might have something to say about that lie. Um, so, uh, like I said, hey, I'm game. I'll bide my time. I'm tough. I've been through a lot. I don't give a shit. And so now the time has come. Because Scotty controls the paintings. And they're not going back in the garden until people do the right thing. Now, I, I was doing the right thing. You know, this, these situations, just because it's a small town and everybody knows everything. Well, everybody, including the school board members and the principal whose daughter was one of the perpetrators, uh, they all knew what was going on, so did the state police. But why didn't anybody do anything? You know, I had a captain, an acting major, a captain, tell me a couple weeks ago, well, that was acceptable back then. If he would have been in my presence... He would have woke up in a hospital. That's how much that pissed me off. And I can't wait till the superintendent hears that conversation. That, that was acceptable. Okay. That was acceptable yeah. back then. Not according to the statutes on the book and how we're supposed to behave as decent human beings. That's not acceptable. Yeah, I realize about males and about the genes that we have that make us act. Because, you know, I know for a fact that we're, we were genetically engineered. And you're like, when the guys say, uh, well, okay, uh, let us make man in our image, and then, okay, once we correct and find all the problems, which is now publicly available, you can read all, some of the bullshit that the Vatican's been hiding from us. And, um, you know, you understand that. I mean, be fruitful and multiply. So we must have got what I call the horny gene. And so people act out that way. And so when you know that that is totally different, but that can drive a human being, but yet I know for a fact that we have an ethereal body inside this because the messengers proved it to me, and I'll explain that later. Um, you know, I, that's what I mean about understanding why people do this. It doesn't make it right, but if you understand why they're doing it, then you try to do the best you can to try to correct the situation. Because these people were very sincere. I love them. Um, some of them have passed since then. 
Um, and if they would have known about it, these people would have passed. Uh, certain people in the community would have made their lives miserable. And that's the way it is. Especially in a small town when everyone thinks. Well, everyone thinks everyone knows everyone else's business because a, a lot of it they do because of the talk, you know. And, um, and then a small community can be very protective. Especially when you're the underdog of the Tri Lakes. Tri Lakes is Tupper Lake, Saranac Lake, and Lake Placid. Lake Placid has had two Olympics. I was involved in the security on one of them, but only in an indirect way, in an indirect way of getting them things because the state police were never tra- trained at Monmouth University in physical security and safety. They're an enforcement agency, and you would not believe when I did my survey what I found. And I, so I did one thing, and it solved that problem. So, um, and, the, and the major in charge of the detail at that time is still pissed at me for that. But if he only knew. And he's one of my cousins. If, yeah. <laughs> if he only knew that he didn't get reelected sheriff because of me. And it wasn't because of that. It was because this senator, very powerful senator from my area, was part of the three. I'm going to call them the three dictators because when they were in the Senate, geez, they basically ran the state. And what they did is back then they, they took the high school teacher thing to another level. Okay. She's hot. Let's get her down at university of Albany and let's make her a Senate page. And of course they all got caught eventually about these, You know, just like this goes on today, these politicians, these very important, very moral leaders, we're screwing these these young girls, college girls. Okay, they were of age, so what? But you see what happens when they go out partying and... But they're in a position of power. power. That's, again, you know, the same as teachers. You're in a position of power, the grades, you know, the whole nine yards. So, um, but... When you shouldn't have been drinking and driving and have an accident and a certain girl who was the daughter of a major of the sack base, who, who was the, the good senator age. was screwing, um, gets killed and ends up in the trunk of the car. Oh, shit. Being transported up to uh, the North Country and buried in a gravel pit that they tried to keep people out of. But someone opened their mouth to me. And you know what? I went to the FBI and you know what? didn't do a goddamn thing, and now I know why. Because my friend who called me and confessed knew he had less than a month to live, and he needed information to get even on someone. And he knew I had that information. But he knew that we came from the same place. You don't give without getting. So he knew he had to offer me something. And what did he give a shit? He was going to be dead in less than a month. So... Yep. So that, knowing that knowledge and sharing it, because you see, this guy was in charge of providing the eyes and ears around a missile bases and a nuclear bomber base in Plattsburgh, New York. So which means he was still attached to these people that I have to deal with once in a while. And um, they, you know, I think they protected him because... I know what agency was told what to do. And so those beautiful parents, uh, the, this patriot who, who made a great career in the Air Force and mother and father and his only daughter, is, uh, they don't know where she is. I don't even know if they're still alive. Now. So that kind of pisses you off too. But when you have that knowledge and then you give it to the wrong people and because maybe someone – from that organization told the other organization, you got to do this. I don't know for a fact, but geez, the way that I, the evidence trail is looking. Um, yep. I think there's somebody else involved and, um, man, if anybody ever did that to my daughter, you know, daughters, you know, um, I get to the bottom of it. I would, and I would hope that someone that did would share that information because I don't think there's anything more precious than than someone you bring into this world and you love and you you know you know when I talk about your parent right yeah so 
So what parent would, would not want something like this? Okay. So, so that's basically that type of philosophy has been my entire life. I've never made every decision right. Okay. I'm human. I've made mistakes like everyone else. I've done things that maybe I shouldn't have done at that time, but, um, Hey, somehow everything worked out. Sorry. Because the way I see it, um, the messengers wouldn't have showed up at my doorsteps at three o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, come aboard. We want to put mom and Tom gold in your pineal gland. And we're going to give you the list of everyone that we did it to. And, uh, we're going to explain to you why we're going to show you how we fold space with what here's all the math. Yeah. Yeah. You need this, 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 this makes perfect sense. I mean, even to things where they can make shit show up on your computer. And, you, and so it's a clue. And so you follow that clue and you get a hold of the person and you call me, you interview them. And they go, yeah, yeah. We were at uh, Tupo beach uh, nine o'clock that date at night. And all of a sudden these 70 and 90 foot waves appeared. And you know what? There was kind of a glow in the sky. We see that's that beam. The only beam that shows across the surface of the earth to hold space, that lower section that has to come up because you need to do that. You bring those two wormholes together. And the fact is, if you're, we live in an electric universe. If you're using plasma, because you have to, <laughs> to, to fold space out of the thing that almost looks like that Star Wars Death Star thing, um, then you're going to have an effect on Earth's water, wherever that beam crosses over the surface of the Earth. Not, I mean, it's still high altitude, but it's still so powerful that it can fold the fabric of space. So you can bet it's going to have a little bit of effect on Earth's oceans. And so they always cross it because they stay in the east when they do it. I mean, the timing, everything I know has to be perfect. It has The moon has to be this far away from the Earth, the whole nine yards, which we come in cycles to know. And you project plasma and you do this, but you're going to you're gonna bring the surf up. And those surfs were 70 to 90 foot waves. Captured by the scouting crew of Point Break 215, which was used in the ending scenes of that movie where the hero and his handler in a helicopter drops him off on the ship where the bad guy is with his surfboard. And, man, when you see that scene on that video, it's absolutely amazing. It's amazing what a piss poor job they did at CGIing the characters and the equipment in. But the waves are just absolutely breathtaking. And that glow in the upper right-hand side of the same pulsing glow is the plasma reflection, plasma beam reflection. And remember, a fourth quarter moon night is a slack tide moon night. So the first thing I did was to check to see earthquake data and weather. Well, there was nothing that would cause such a thing to happen. So I'm always a skeptic. I have to dig into shit to, to, to be confident enough to run my mouth about it. And so, and, but you see, they did that in September, then the fourth quarter moon night in October, and then the fourth quarter moon night in November of 214, each time showing me things, each time coming, showing me things, and, and teaching me shit that I have no right knowing. So what happens is each time I get this, Someone posts these amazing waves, and the last one in Tupelo was in um, Oahu Beach, Hawaii. It was the NBC News cameraman who is a surfer and who loves to film surfers. And so as soon as I got down the information and knew it happened on that day and everything, but he didn't post it, I called him just before he went on. He said, Scott, I, I, I've got to go on for the 11 o'clock news, but call me back. So I did, and so I explained things to him. And... But I didn't tell him what happened and why. And then I asked him, your surfer. I said, yeah. He said, look at the day. I said, fourth quarter moon night. What were you doing expecting to film someone surfing on a fourth quarter moon night? It's a slack tide moon. Man, paddle boat it. You're not going surfing. So he, he, he was like shocked. He goes, you're right. So he said, how come that happened? So I told him. Blew his mind. <laughs> He said his exact word. Dude, you're blowing my mind. All I want to do is video surfers. I said, you idiot. <laughs> so we had a good laugh and everything. And I explained everything to him. And so I had charted all this information on a map to know because there's math involved. See, that was the hint they were giving me. Okay? 
that that to, a to cause and physics. <laughs> a lot of math and physics because you got your GPS position, you got where the moon is, you got this star Bethlehem directly overhead, and then you've got this one beam that comes down which forms a certain type of triangle. So when then you multiply that out, then you start getting the feel of the math involved in this. And then you can also, by doing this, by calculating, knowing the physics of water, you, so what's it going to take to make that wave that big? Hey, guess where else this happened one time? And the Exodus story, okay? So, see, you know, if you can make, if you can make waves come one way, you can also maybe use two devices and make go waves come towards you too, because one's shoving, the other one's shoving the opposite direction. And oh, oh the seas part. Really? How's that happen? Oh, the earthquake story. Uh, that's uh, you know all this bullshit. Well, how come in this one spot the seas went, and then hey, you got a clear path here. You better run, but if you got a clear path, because the other guys coming behind you, we got a surprise for him. Okay, so it happens, but you, but. But when the other guys get too close, then they say, well, we got to shut this thing off. So, boom, the waves come back together. And you lost you lost some people, though. You forgot about this. You lost some people there. Unfortunately, you can get everybody across. But the other guys lost everybody. Okay? Wow, how's that happen? Oh, we're God's chosen people. Must be. And this is true, though, because they, they explained this to me. Oh, we're God's chosen people because they lost, we won. Think about our history. Okay? History is written by the victor. Okay, so you win. So the story's yours are right, right? So let's let's make up a good story because we want people to like us because we, we didn't do really do the right thing, but you know what? Hey, it turned out that way, so yeah, let's write this. And that's what we've been fed all our lives. Bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. All the way back to our creation. Yeah, let, uh, let us make man in our image. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right, right. God. Elohim right. is plural. <laughs> so, so in any of that, this how far, this is how far it goes back to our creation. Okay. Well, so like, before we go any like further, that. and I want to yeah. go further. I want to keep going, but we do have to do our second musical break. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So on this break, we have Michaela Hay again with Gravity Mirror Pins and Needles, as well as Collapse. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this musical break.
on pins and needles Every word through a microscope You keep stomping down on the ground While I've been stuck on this tightrope I just wanna say what I wanna say Without your sentence I'm not willing to do the time When I'm innocent And I'm innocent
Welcome back, and thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. Tonight, we are joined by Scott and Laura Varden. You guys, welcome back, and thanks so much for being here. You're more than welcome. Thank you. So back to the story to try to draw all these, all these things together to prove the point about the connection. Because the point is, we're all connected. Here on Earth, we're all connected. Not just this earth and we don't realize how important it is. We don't realize how special we are. And so we're way off the path and this has happened more than once in humanity. We're kind of, as Dolores Cannon explains it, a failed experiment. We have free will. Uh, Unfortunately, some of us get caught up in the special benefits of being in a human body uh, and and then take that way too far. Well, it's happened before to a little place called Atlantis, which happens to be under D.C. ice in Antarctica. Anyone who can't figure that out by now and read the material that's out there, uh, that they're just lazy and they don't want to face the truth because all the information's out there. And um, so these guys, they went way off the path, and um, they were brilliant. Um, they weren't all bad, but you see, what usually happens, like, oh, geez, right now the people that are in charge ruling us like we need that, um, are uh, they, what these Atlanteans do is they really went apeshit on the uh, genetic engineering. So all these mythical creatures that we think never existed, except maybe someone got into the local weed, uh, no, they actually existed, and these guys were the ones who were making them because they lost all the point of life, and they just got into their knowledge and playing God. Well, I think that job belongs to the source, period. And you know what? Even the aliens say this in one of the books, um, and this is not a pretend fiction book. This is like an agency's book. It says if you want to talk about God and think about God, think in terms of the goddess Diana in Greek mythology. Because what brings form life? What brings forth life in our existence? It's the female. Of course, the male has to participate. The man, the burdens on the female. What woman would knowingly send her son to war over something that really shouldn't have to happen, right? I mean, there's so many things like this that they brought up about, you know, you don't have it right, guys. There's not one organized religion that's anywhere near being close. Um, when you look at it, it's almost like a, well, look at the Vatican. Look at the Catholic Church. I was brought up Catholic. But but look at what's been exposed, what's been going on. Look at the Vatican Bank, the problems they've had there. Look at the pedophilia. Look at the, you know, the molestation. Um, you know, if you know, we, we get down on people or not. We certain people think because someone's sexual orientation uh, is in a certain direction that is not in theirs that they're that they're horrible monsters or aberration or anything. I I don't think that. I I just think that um, what they have to do is be responsible with what their version of love is and everything. But that doesn't happen. I mean, and think of everything else that we get into, our environment, how we destroy it. Um, you know, like, you have a choice. Make the right choice, make the wrong choice. So bringing this together, the second night of the visits, they showed me something that absolutely terrified me and caused me a lot of problems for opening my mouth for a while. They showed me the end of the world because they showed me angels, untold numbers, coming to earth, ancient structures, bulging with souls, coming back to earth. Souls in my area where I was living, coming down from the sky. You can see, it's like an electronic thing. It's really a strange looking thing, but it's, it it's vibrates and it's, it's, it's a form of light. And they go into the ground, and then when you check the ground out the next morning, there's these little fluffy piles of soil, but there's no hole. So that, being brought up Catholic and being 
brainwashed by the nuns of the Holy Ghost uh, on some things, but not this. At the end of the world, when Christ comes again, he'll be judging the living and the dead. So what was I supposed to think? Oops, I think we're in for a rough time. And so I shared this with someone I shouldn't have, and it caused some problems. And But they got resolved, especially when, when the problem finds out that his children are being visited, too. So um, it turned out well in the long run, and everybody's satisfied, but... Uh, some people still don't want to face the truth. We're at a point where we have a choice because it's happened to other planets, and I'm not sure about why, but the asteroid belt was caused by the plasma strikes when one of these inbound planets called Nibiru got too close to another planet called, I think, Tiamat, and it was such a force because we live in an electric universe, which means you get electrical charge. And when they got too close, there was a huge plasma strike, which, by the way, caused the Grand Canyon on another bypass. And then the big canyon in Mars, those are plasma strikes, been proven in a laboratory. And you can, when you can do the scale thing and cause plasma to strike certain elements, it looks exactly like what we have on Mars and the Grand Canyon. People don't want to face that. Oh, it was erosion. Really? Wow. Where'd that water come from? Because, man, that's miles deep. No, because you're not taught that in school, so you don't think that. You don't want to think that. The universe is kind of a violent place in a way. But maybe there's a reason for it. And the thing is, is that uh, the Atlanteans got out of hand with the genetic engineering, and, you know, that's not their job. The creation of life is really not in the hands of, of certain species because you, st- you come to Earth and you have that free will, and so you start making the wrong choices and you start having fun being really stupid and making these grotesque and awful things. That causes pain to these things, too, but you don't care because you made them. And so... So pole ship comes, and Apgood was right. And Einstein, who was also visited, uh, kind of gave him the heads up and said, yeah, you're right, but, you know, people get on their hands about that. Now look at Einstein. His knowledge was given to him by the messengers, yet someone else took it and made it into the most destructive weapon that in the past has been used on Earth before, too, by our creators, and boy, did they make a mess of things. And Nikola Tesla. Uh, yeah, and same with Tesla, right? I mean, because, see, people are controlling this knowledge and this information that can be used good or for bad, but let's, let's use it for bad because we we want all the cookies in the box. So if we have the baddest thing, we can go over there and say, hey, you got some really nice cookies, and I want those cookies. And if you don't give them to me, I'm going to use my box, and you're <laughs> going to have a hard time. Basically, simplistically, that's it. Think about our foreign policy. Oil. Uh, natural resources, natural resources uh, good growing for certain crops that have to be in a certain environment, certain fruits, you know, things like that. I mean, that's been a corporate thing. Not that people did it on purpose or anything, but you get caught up in this. I got caught up in the material world, not once, but twice before I learned. But you, um, that's what's happened. And that's what's happened all over the world. And that's why we have all these problems. People shouldn't be starving to death. There's lots of places to live in this world. There's lots of food to eat. But if people are controlling that for their own benefit, then they're going to get the maximum they can out of it, which means that you have to make things like, oh, diamonds scarce when they really aren't. They're not worth shit. Unless you can use them in a certain laser technology. But the point is, you take that example, and you come up with a great marketing plan girl's best friend, and if you don't get your woman a diamond, you're an asshole, and, you know, the whole nine yards. When you think about that mentality and how it drives a certain market and causes people to do things to reach that goal, when it, the goal is not even necessary, but they don't make the right decisions to reach that goal, and then you create problems. And so that's what we've been doing, and I don't have the answer. I don't know something in our discussions today struck me is about when you look at the players, what's happening in the world with certain leaders, 
it's almost like the personalities of certain Anunnaki in history who live incredibly hundreds of thousands of years because, see, they consume monatomic gold. That's the true secret of gold. That's the philosopher's stone, the fountain of youth, the whole nine yards, because I know what it did for me. Um, well, you're going to run into problems. So, so if you're coming back to Dodge, and you got a way of manipulating these people to make things easy for you to come in and break and pillage again. Um, wow. When you look at the Anunnaki Wars and the history, it's almost like history is repeating itself, except certain people are being manipulated. I know how and why and the technology and whole nine yards. And it would blow people's minds if they knew really what was going on. Because they can't handle it. It's comfortable. You, oh, God created us and we're special. Really? Yeah, so what, what that guy, JC, I don't think that was his real name. In fact, I know it wasn't. But the story goes, one of the things he said was, uh, my father has flocks you know not of. What he was talking about is there's more than a few of you that look just like you. Human Ooh. beings. Yeah, but not a lot more advanced. Uh, and then there's all these other ones that would scare the shit out of you if you didn't realize that there's no harm there. Um, I'm sure there's, just like us, there's some assholes out there that would cause you harm. But the ones that I have met, including the one reptilian I met, that I don't know, I know there's several different reptilians, but this guy was a sweetheart. And he was young, but he, but, um, so, so what do you do? What do you do with this group, right? So these guys are manipulating to cause things happen to make what they want to happen, and that's the truth. And, boy, the personalities, it's not that they're the same person, but it's their modus operandi that you can see in their ancient writings what they did and what these guys are doing. Well, either they read the playbook and thought it was the right thing to do or someone is so advanced that they not only can genetically engineer the human species, because you see, where's a missing link? You're never going to find them. So if you go to the right documents, a lot of them the Vatican owns, a lot of them are in the most secure facility in the world in Israel, and those are the Dead Sea Scrolls they don't want you to know about. Yeah, I think there's more in tombs that you know still haven't been found yet. Like There's more popping up every day. It's amazing. Right, and, that, and you see, though, but when you look at, not scripture, but when you look at prophecy, it says that all truths re will be revealed in end times. And we're living in the end times. Mm -hmm. But, so, naturally, being a grandfather of, I think, the three most beautiful children in the world, um, wow, that really was a downer for me. And it was really hard on me, very depressing. Okay. I had lots of plans. But then you find out, well, there's, even though, yeah, it's going to happen, but there's another option for the people that aren't the ones that created the problems. Okay? <laughs> you can find that in Dolores Cannon's work called The Three Ways for Volunteers <laughs> in the New Earth. As much as you want to think it's a fantasy, it's not. There's no way that someone could make up a story like this, nor be as well-respected and traveled through the world spreading the message of Dolores Cannon. And with the thousands of people that she has regressed and the information that has come forth, and they have no connection to each other. So how, they, can, how can they? And yet their stories are um, very similar and actually complement each other. Complement each and other. And, you know, they validate each other. And that's exactly how the messengers have been working with me because... Your human mind doesn't want to accept certain things because you were programmed not to accept those things. And then all of a sudden, those things are real and you can see them and you experience them and you interact with them. But then you have to, when you're te they're teaching you, not only will they explain things, at, but they'll lead you to that source that confirms it. Not one, but two other sources. And 
things that you never went searching for on your computer show up on your computer and then you start looking into it and you well, how the hell does that happen? I know for a fact it's not Microsoft. I don't like Bill Gates. I know too much. Right. <laughs> that guy. A lot, of people, yeah. a lot of people, if they only knew what I knew, if they only knew they thought they were so smart, they thought they were so successful so they were because they were so smart and they've done some things that you cannot believe, they do not know what they're in for. And that makes me feel bad because I care about everyone, even the assholes. I've proven that in my life. And but the point is, is that I, I try to find good and everything and good and, and good in people. And um, uh, there are some people that I realize now that and they're not the ones, to be honest with you, as bad as the mafia and the Irish mob and all these other things that maybe MS-13 is not such a good time. But the point is, is that they're really not the enemy. OK, they're not the they're real enemy. It's their their action, their environment is created by the people who are really running things that it's not that they allow it. They create situations that allow these things to occur, uh, to have these organized crime groups take advantage of other people. But it's not that simple just to condemn them because you've got to understand their total history as far as the individuals and why they're doing it in the whole nine yards. But they wouldn't be doing it if someone didn't give them the opportunity by doing something worse, which makes people look like, you know, people don't want to hear the truth about about our leaders and things like that. Yeah, I'm, they'd you know, rather follow I'm blindly an, I, and not be bothered with all this other stuff that right. the rest of us know about. So, so it's troubling because, as far as I'm concerned, Trump's a, a Paul guy. Okay, I don't like what comes out of his mouth. I know the truth. I had an experience with him, and work experience, and 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 his lawyer set his ass straight about um, to think about something and before he wanted to play. Let's make a deal, and and then they wanted something else, but I didn't want to get involved, and um, but I did. Years later, find out some information and pass it on to the person that his lawyer that had helped me out in that situation, and um, and and I did it because of the right thing to do. In my world, two wrongs don't make a right, and um, if, because if this guy did something wrong, doesn't mean that some other guy who who is about to pay the price. Um, and boy, people are going to be surprised about this asshole. He was one of the three dictators that I call, and uh, involved in that accident. And he went on to think he was With even more important. Page. Yeah, and his name is George Pataki. Okay, and when he found out that I found out what was going on, he's the one that allowed shit to get worse and things to happen. Okay, uh, but his day's coming too. So, um, because you know the people who sit on the board of the um, Garden Museum have a right to know why the paintings aren't hanging on those walls because those paintings are worth over a billion dollars now. And they were made with the help of the messengers so we could look at them and stare at them in awe and, and, and see more than one message that's in those paintings. The most and a lot of way, times there's like a mathematical configuration. and uh, Right. It's amazing and the different things that are in that. there. They don't, they don't understand that and look at it. But the most important painting in that whole group, what do you think it is? Oh, uh, she's not. Which Jesus. Huh? Yes. Ah, you very got good. It. Yes. Christ on the Sea of Galilee is one of the ones that they borrowed. Okay. Borrowed. So, I like uh, how you say that. <laughs> because, you know, because they have to come back. And these guys will be the better for it. And they weren't villains. They just made the wrong choice. But they made the right choice for them because they thought they were helping their people. So I can't contend someone knowing the situation, knowing what went on in Northern Ireland. I cannot condemn someone wanting to be free of the rule of the British. Because, I mean, there's so many things that happen. Um, when, uh, to the Irish people that over the rule of the British. It's not like people don't realize that the British were 
during a time period when they controlled the seas and everything, I mean, they were raping and pillaging all over the world, right, for their own financial benefit. I mean, my father explained things to me about just one thing that was so, so revealing was the fact that um, the flora and the fauna, like in, in um, India, okay, one of these things that he explained to me about was rhododendrons and where they came from and how they grow and the diversity in the whole nine yards. Okay, so now you're you're running India, a bunch of these generals or whatever, lords or whatever the hell they think they are. And so they find these beautiful plants. Wow. Now, England's kind of a perfect country to grow in that environment. So let's dig up all these plants and get them back home to my garden in England and on the estate. And then let's destroy all the rest of them because I don't want anybody else to have them. You wouldn't believe how many plants that's happened to. Okay. So, so that's the mentality we deal with. We deal with this mentality. We have a choice when we see something and we have a choice. Make the right decision or make the wrong decision. Make the selfish decision or make the decision that's best for humanity. Well, this is where it's all gone. Okay? This free will thing, this failed experiment, we're just making these choices for the selfish reason. I've got billions and billions of dollars because I'm the big Amazon of the world. Uh, well, you we know, are down I, to our last 20 minutes of the show, and we haven't really but, hit on your guys' shared, like, sighting experience. And and there's, like, I want to keep listening because I'm intrigued by every little detail, but um, definitely want to hear about your guys' shared experiences and what happened with your injection with your pineal gland and how that right. actually helped you. Right. So, so here's what happened. They bring me up in the ship, which I didn't realize. I knew I was up there witnessing these structures on the ship and everything, they bring me in and let remember that at the time, they inject my pineal gland with my, uh, with my atomic gold. It didn't hurt, obviously. They set me right back where I was standing. And then the park went over in the northwest sky close and just sat there. So I run in the house and wake her up and say, get dressed, it's cool out, I want you to see something. And then I go to the kids' room because our son was is in senior year and his fiance, who they're married now and both in very senior successful. In college. <laughs> uh, they're in the other bedroom and it, it was on this really high queen size bed. I'm talking it was a mattress or that high. <laughs> so what does Scott do? They can't wake up. So let's tip them off the bed and on the floor. Maybe they'll wake them up. It did. Now this happened twice, right? And then I even nudged them with my foot a little bit, maybe, and they still wouldn't wake up. So I said, well, tough shit. So <laughs> I bring Laura outside, and they said, look at that right there. And oh, my God. And yeah. I saw the ship. It was glowing this rose red color and just stood there in awe. And the funny thing is, is, is you, you tend to think afterward in ruminations going, why didn't I grab my camera? Right. Why didn't I grab my phone and video it? It's like at the time you are so engrossed okay. in in the beauty and, and the awe of it that now, it's, it doesn't even cross your mind. Here's the perfect example of that because Chris and the boys redid, it's called the extended version of tech, Life in Technicolor. And the cover for that extended version of that song is exactly what happened to me. They're all standing looking up because they admitted about their UFO experience. And they're looking up, but they are dead frozen. And that's what happens because, you know what, these guys can stop time. And they proved this because she and I witnessed for 40 minutes the ship being over here and not seeing a streak or a movement at all, but then it's over here. It was just bouncing around in the sky. And boom, then we actually boom, saw it boom, moving, boom. you know, at, at speeds and in – Directions that were not now, typical you, in you physics. Know it, it, you know, um, it wasn't any of our shit. That's for sure. Uh, it was so, beautiful. And we have we have stuff. We have stuff. Trust me. And so what <laughs> happens is, so <laughs> so after forty minutes, okay, after forty minutes, and this proves how this is one of the proof that I have how they speak through you. I all of a sudden point to it and I said, now to Laura, I said, now watch this, and and when I did that, that thing took off back into out of the atmosphere so fast that it left the largest, brightest, pinkish-reddish streak in the sky that stayed there for several minutes. Yeah. Wow. Now, 
See, we live gorgeous. We live halfway between the Homeland Security Electronic Northeast Border Detection Center in Burke, New York, and Fort Drum, New York, and also Hancock Airfield, where they run all the drones, the Air Force uh, Army Reserve. So, see, these guys got radars, right? So, they knew that, they knew that in between there, and I knew this. So, the very next morning, the first thing I did is called into NASA and explained things to them. And I said, but you see, you got to understand one thing. You better talk to Comey before you think that you're going to turn this into a fuck story. And that's exactly what I told them. I said, don't even think about coming up. So, but it didn't make any difference because some organization assholes rented the house across the street bugged our house without a warrant because a federal judge we know personally he would have never given them a warrant and they bugged their house and now they can't find their bugs because they were so stupid not to know where I came from so they called me in and asked me where they were and I said geez I don't know and you see there's a senator who I've known for a long time (laughs) yeah and you see, like I used to use those things too, and I used to, they all have these numbers, and you have to sign them out. I took this device, and here's the numbers, and I signed my name. So whoever signed those out's got a problem. Because they all can be traced. So, hmm, talk about bowed heads and shut your mouth type thing. So they listened to me for the next 30 minutes, and then I got up and walked out and left, and I haven't heard from them since. So, uh, but the next morning after yeah. we saw the ship, I was this. making breakfast. And I'm, on, I'm on the computer right. setting up something that I had planned for that day. I get a request from some people from an organization or an agency in Israel who I kind of know because I've had a relationship with them since '69, and I owe them a favor because they kind of saved my life. So they somehow they knew. So they said, hey, Scott, we want, we want to talk to you. Oh, really? Where, where are you? Okay, we're up in L.A. and we're raising money. Why are you raising money this time? Because I know what you did the last time when you raised money when someone pissed you off. And they said, well, because you see those tunnels that came in from Gaza? Well, they had false bottoms full of explosives. So they captured someone, cut their artery, drag them in there. And so a bunch of the good guys, soldiers, would go try to save them. And when they got enough of those good guys in those tunnels, they went oh, and blew them up. Boy, that's evil. So you bet your ass it is. So they know that I have an expertise about recognizing faces and aging them forward and backwards. Because I proved that the FBI with the Gardner case. And, um, but, you see, they didn't know that I proved that to them several times before, but I kind of had to keep out of the picture. So then my friend brought me into the picture, and so I had no choice. So... <clears throat> They, um, I guess they're still looking for the bugs. And um, so that's one thing they did. And that wasn't the agreement. But you see, I confuse that with the agreement with the gardener as compared to the agreement with, you got aliens coming to your house every day, every night now for like months at a time. So what the fuck's going on, Scott? I don't know. I didn't even know who they were at the time. I had to find the right documents who identified them because they described, they're the only ones that ever described being able to fold space. They called it bend space. It was the Russians. And, of course, they broke up, and they had a lot of documents that got out. And so uh, bend space, they did a piss-poor picture uh, of the drawing of the starship. But why did they destroy the message in the original book that told them what my friend, who they visited that time, who was responsible for life sustainable on the space station, who got us an $85 million building from NASA at Clarkson University, who admitted to me about his experience after I shared mine with him. Um, why? Okay. There's your technology gift right there. He was our technology gift to get us to the next stage. But... Why are we weaponizing space? I can understand maybe a threat from some other alien species, but you, you, you know we we weaponize space against other nations and our because we wanted the upper hand. What better upper hand than being in space and be able to mess with you on the ground and you not know the truth? So, so we take everything that we're given, and we have a choice. Okay, use this technology to do good, but. <clears throat> 
hey, let's use this technology to, to do what we think is good. And so we can have certain people gain and wealth and all this shit. And uh, we use this technology. Now think about how quickly we exploded our advanced technology since World War II. Mind boggling. So, like we said, we go from a party phone to a cell phone in my lifetime. No. It doesn't work that way in evolution. Um, we were given we were given some smarts in this DNA experiment by the Anunnaki, and um, but also this this is this planet was supposed to be a certain thing and didn't turn out that way, and so now you know humanity or life on Earth has had several chances and and has had a what we call pushing the reset button, and that's what's happening. But I think this time uh, we got a choice. We can change things. We can make it not happen. But it's going to take all of us and, and everyone. And, and and part of this is that I hate to because I'm not that tight. I'm a very, to be honest with you, I can be a very vindictive person. Because if someone gets to a point and, and it's that bad for me, uh, if, if I could tell you what has happened, some of the people, and I didn't, directly cause it, but they got what they deserved, okay? Um, so, I'm, I, yeah, I've got that element in me. But the point is, it's, it, it just, it's not a couple thousand, it's not a couple hundred thousand, not a couple million. The earth has to come together and we have to get back on the path or <laughs> it's lights out. The people who are on the path, they're going to go to the new earth. And um, yeah, all this money that they has disappeared from the Pentagon's budget and were, was raised by other sources, which which are not morally acceptable, um, has built those underground bases where they thought they were going to survive this coming cataclysm. However, one of the first things they taught me was, hey, you better rethink the legend of St. Patrick, because you know what? That's not the story, because it's a Celtic prophecy, because the Celts were a very advanced race. And they discovered North America first, which we know is a fact as far as the European races after this the last calamity and, and the world reset, the people survived. And so they developed and they were kind of good guys, I thought. And so they come to this country and they learned some shit. And one of the things they learned was probably someone like me. They were given information and there were no snakes in the ground in Ireland. And uh, the snakes in the ground, when you use that word figuratively, you can figure out who they are, who think they're going to be safe in the underground bunkers that they built with our money. And we're not good enough to be down there with them. Um, but, geez, now they're finding out that, oh, this inbound binary system with the infrared star is really heating up the magma in the earth. And the thermometers in our underground bunkers are starting to go up. And it's going to get a lot worse. So it's not be a good time, you know. It can be like, I'm not. But it's not an infrared oven, but, you know, it could be. <laughs> it could be, that's for sure. So, you see, there's always, I think the source always has a way of covering things. It's kind of the way I run an operation. Is that when I, when I especially this, because I've learned, I, I, I've learned the hard way so many times dealing with these people. The way the Gardner Museum return painting is set up, is everybody has to do their part. And whoever does not their part, there's always something else that's already in place that's going to happen that's going to make them wish they did their part. And um, so, like I said, there's not exactly too many poppers sitting on the board of the Garden Museum room, uh, board of directors. The paintings are worth over a billion bucks now, easily proven. And I told them, that. God, when they get back in the museum, you're going to have to take reservations for a year in advance for people to get in there and see them. And the story behind it is so unique that they're going to make it even more. Why? You know, I want to see this. And so, so soon, soon, if my friends don't, uh, and I'm not counting on my friends in the Boston office anymore because this operation was run out of Washington and then Jim got a bye-bye note from Donnie. And so things change once in a while. I, We'll communicate with Jim, but I, I, I know things, and so I have to, um, I have to act with the knowledge that I have and the experience that I have in order to make 
things right here. It's the same thing with us and Earth. If we don't get back on this path, we've got a choice. And and the reason I'm saying this is because when I got deep into this ancient research, I found uh, never in my life that I read Velikovsky's work. Velikovsky did not understand what was going on. He only tran in most of his work. He never gave his two cents. He translated these documents and told the stories in these ancient documents. It's about these other heavenly bodies coming into our solar system and the problems that it caused. And he took an example, even though he took the Inuit example, and they have legends about when the when the uh, raven swallowed the earth. Okay, that's when that's when your three days of darkness is when the the big planet gets in front of the sun and at a certain angle and timeline where it's going to cause this and so what they said was "Ooh, that was bad so they made up this story about the raven swallowing the sun that's how that's why the raven is so important in that northwestern uh, culture of, of, of american indians and so then they go on to describe that about these other heavenly bodies but the earthquakes and the volcanoes were just like crazy right so bad everybody was oh i think i think things are going downhill fast and then what they all said all over the world at the same timeline, this is the key. It wasn't just the Inuits. It was all these other organizations that could keep records, organizations, civilizations that could keep records. All of a sudden, the sky came close to Earth. And then things quieted down. So the Inuits, not understanding the mechanics of how that happens, oh, Shit, that better not happen again. So, hey, I got an idea. Let's build totem poles, put around our village. Sky comes down, we'll sit in totem poles, and we say, that's the story. That's the truth. It makes sense to them. Why are they just around their villages, right? Why are they? And why are all these strange faces carved on them? It's what they experienced. They're trying to only, in all this ancient art and this, these things, these drawings, these carvings, and everything, they're trying to let you understand what they witnessed, what they experienced. But people don't want to realize that they want to say things or they realize it and then they, they're reputable. But then the, organ, the, the, the group that they belong to say, oh, you can't say that because I'll lose my job. You know what I mean? All my work is useless because I said this. That's what's happened. People don't realize that. But it's in writing and you can see it. But everyone's too lazy to do that. They don't want to read anymore. So that means at one time. Messengers folded space, moved their planet, saved their planet from total destruction. They must have thought that we deserved it. But when you look at the timeline of these people, they weren't living like we're living today. And I'm not knocking our advanced technology and everything. I'm just talking about what we're doing with it. So they did it before. So that leaves this question in my mind. And that leads me to drive to try to share the information hey, maybe we have a chance of not having this other reality. Maybe we have a chance if we can just come together and get back on the path. That's been my hope, and that's why I don't give up sharing my information and story. I love people. I've been all over the world. I've met so many different people. I've met – I could go on for hours, and, and people would say – but people know that I've had experience with these people that – are just amazing. Um, and, and so it breaks my heart, you know, uh, because I love it. But I also have my own family, too. And I have my pets, and I have my greenhouse, and I have my garden. <laughs> I love Earth. So, but I know what the options are. And there's no there's no in-between. There's no almost. But Velikovsky made a mistake. Because he said, I think it was the volcanic ash in the sky. Well, how can, if you can't see the sky because of volcanic ash, how can you tell the sky came close to Earth? The only way you can do it is by witnessing space being folded. And that's what they did. Okay? Because and that, yeah. the, the accelerated knowledge and information, um, and also the, the focus that he has been on and his desire to tell people was all catalyzed that night when we had that shared experience of seeing the ship and then him being taken up and being injected. Cause okay. like I said, the next morning I found the injection site 
um, I thought he had a sore and had been picking at it. And I you know, was like, what, what did you do? And I so had a better know. look at it. But I it was a round red spot with a like a little right. injection hole. Look, it, it looked like injection. I was but just like, when you look at the mechanics of the brain and the p- location of the brain, exactly it's directly in the right location. in line with the pineal But value. see, so as soon as I put my finger up there and touched it, it's like they turned the switch on. And so I said to Laura, I said, I think there's someone else in my head. Oh, More than one. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. I mean, he there's would someone else. Say, I, I'd say, be quiet. Someone else is telling you something because I didn't understand until I got into the research, until I found the right document to know who they were. But the secret is, why did the Russians cross out the message that was given? And in column two seventeen to two twenty two. What timeline are we in now? When did all this shit with our weather, volcanoes, and earthquakes really start speeding up? Okay. So there, to me, that's just irrefutable evidence. And when someone doesn't want you to know that, why? They don't want you to know what was said. But I know what was said. But ever since that, I mean, he, he so, sees things. So from that point on, I, could, I all of a sudden started seeing things that, like, what is this, you know? And, and, and especially at night with the way that angels will be in an orb and, and they'll shoot a, a, like a beam of light at you to get your attention. And then... They'll start moving and then they'll form, come out of that org form and they, what we know. Now, see, I don't know what, what we were taught to believe angels look like. Because I know they've done this at other times, especially when I was a kid coming home for supper a little late. My father was very strict about that. And um, a five foot article landed in the field on my right. And the dog no saw him. The dog saw him and said, eh, "We don't want anything to do with this guy." And they ran home. And I was in sight in my house, but no, I was just stupid enough to go down that road and go meet that Mister Five Foot Articol. But it wasn't an Articol. But they knew, they knew my love for Articols and things like that. So they'll they'll make themselves to you. How powerful is that? Make you think that you're seeing an Articol when really it's an alien there to have a little chat with you. But you don't remember it until the right time. That's the whole right. thing. It happened so many times. Yeah, because they didn't let him remember things until, until he was that 64 night. years 64 old. 64 years old, and I've been visited all my life. You know, Unfortunately, been taken. Unfortunately, Scott and Laura, we're at the end of our time. Yeah. I don't want to go. Like, I wish I had, like, three more hours. But we do have the after party if you guys would like to join us. Sure. sure. So, well, so basically, guys. that's my message. I'm just a messenger. That's mm-hmm. all. I'm just doing what I was asked to do. And uh, we appreciate you offering, offering this platform. This platform. To get I've been on. I think out. I've been on like three or four other shows in the last since this has happened. You know, and then but some people, you know, they just think it's bullshit. But how come my story never changes? How come everything I can describe right to a T? You can't do that and make up a story. You can't lie. I don't care what no. writer you are. You can't keep. And who would story. honestly go out and, and say yeah. these things if it wasn't I, true? What? You know, a lot of people try not to share home. this, but I'm so I, glad that you guys did come out to share this. And if you guys would like to come, uh, not you, but our listeners would like to come join us in the after party, look us up under tessa.n.thomas30 or give me a call 970 335 956. 9596. Um, you guys, until next time, nighty night, love and light, take care of my views, and don't forget, we're all in this together, to get, uh, together we can make the world a little better, and together, my friends, we are Paradox Media, because without you, there is no us. <laughs>